everyone. We're here looking at the history of art and technology part two. So um, as we kind of left off, we were in the World War II era. We were thinking about lots of different uh, sort of factors that um, led to this uh, incredible blossoming of uh, technological innovation. Um, although most of it uh, was uh, kind of started at the, you know, defense level and uh, kind of tied up in the so-called, you know, war project. Um, what you see at the close of World War II is really, a, you know, first of all, a time of kind of global healing um, and certainly a time for healing, you know, in um, Europe and in uh, Japan and uh, in, you know, economies and cultures that were really negatively affected um, by the war more than more than others. Um, and you uh, you see a, a sort of um, optimism take hold that we briefly discussed. Um, and uh, what you also start to see is you start to see some of those um, some of those things that were put together for research purposes. Uh, morph into kind of uh, more academic research and more sort of um, solid uh, ground for artistic experimentation. So if we look at the study questions for today, um, we're going to talk a little bit about why computer art took so long um, to get into the mainstream. Um, you know, if we're looking at computers um, or computer-like uh, objects uh, being invented in the 1850s or, you know, 1860s, um, why is it that that sensibility took so long to uh, to kind of get into uh, what we would consider, um, you know, fine art? And we're also going to think about what held people back from using computers and uh, digital technology creatively. Um, yeah, we've looked at a lot of kind of functional uses for technology and the development of that, along with the in, in industrial arts. Um, and so we're going to talk about how technology was able to finally sort of break away from uh, that sort of uh, curse of the functional. Um, we're going to talk about uh, the popularization of the personal computer. Um, and we're also going to talk about uh, some of the devi devices. And when I say device, I don't mean literally like, you know, device. Um, I mean, uh, like a strategy. Um, what were some of those strategies used by early computer artists and, and what, you know, sort of went into uh, a quintessential kind of early computer look? Um, we're also, uh, lastly, going to kind of like move all the way to the present and think about uh, when exactly did artists become interested in networks and the internet? Um, so the sort of common sense answer to that, of course, is, well, it's obviously after the internet came to be, um, but even after after uh, the internet was brought into existence, it still took a, a good amount of time for artists to really uh, think about how to um, really use the tools. So if we start off, we're going to kind of think about the birth of computer art, um, which uh, computer art proper, I guess what I would call computer art proper, is um, something that started, I would say, in uh, this country, in Japan, um, and also in uh, Germany and England. Um, so those were the four kind of main countries that really had... Um, had the technological uh, capabilities, but not only did they have the te technological capabilities, but they had the kind of like, you know, free time and money to burn um, to create something that a lot of people perceive as being, you know, potentially unnecessary or potentially um, uh, not important. So, um, so you'll see that, you know, it's really the kind of hallmark of a highly industrialized economy that uh, fine art has a, a place usually. Um, and that's just kind of a, uh, a, not a really a truism, but it's something that kind of exists, you know, throughout history um, that, you know, if you're literally starving, um, you're probably not going to have time to make a certain kind of art. Um, Will you make uh, will you make art? Probably, yeah. I mean, uh, art is kind of fundamental to the human condition. 
um, but it might not be art with, um, you know, highly sophisticated uh, technology that's only available in a couple of countries at this time. So, so if we look at um, what happened in the United States specifically, we had, you know, researchers from all over the world coming to uh, study at, you know, either MIT or the sort of Stanford UC Berkeley corridor. Um, and those two corridors uh, of activity um, formed along universities, but they also formed along research and development for corporations. And some of those corporations were corporations that were in involved in warfare, like the Rand Corporation or... Um, Boeing is another big one that uh, really sponsored a lot of early computer art, but was also sort of um, leading the charge for, you know, weapon sales in the Korea to Vietnam era. So uh, that kind of legacy, you know, continues um, into the 70s um, and even into the 80s. Um, and some could argue even into the now. But what we're seeing is really this kind of like bi-coastal kind of development of these two technology corridors. And we're kind of seeing um, a very academic sort of approach to, um, to art and technology. And so probably the next, you know, 20 slides that we look at are going to be from this era. And I do think it's really important to realize that this wasn't like... Um, you know, j like j Joe or Jane artist, um, you know, hanging out in Madison, trying to uh, express themselves. This was computer scientist at MIT plays with his equipment. Um, and it's a very, it's a very different um, kind of gesture from a social and an economic perspective uh, for somebody who's already embedded in, in the system uh, to sort of, you know, have the freedom to experiment. Um, so when we start talking a little bit later about some of the later developments in digital technology, I think that's when people talk about the demo democratization of digital technology, um, this is really what they're talking about. Um, they're talking about, um, you know, the fact that who's making art that involves technology in the early 1960s? Well, it's, you know, Desmond Paul Henry, who's also has the technological ability to also work on bomb sites. Um, and uh, he was sort of one of the early precursors of the whole idea of a drawing, a drawing or a drawing machine that might be pre-programmed. Um, and so even though this is way early uh, in the game um, and he's not even using a computer, um, he is using a sort of set of repeated uh, motions created by a set of parameters. So on a conceptual level, it's very uh, similar to what you might see uh, come out of an actual, you know, al digital algorithm. Um, here we have kind of a genuine uh you know, article, actual work of early computer art, um, not sort of like the previous image that we looked at was kind of inspired by um, the idea of computer art. And uh, A. Michael Knoll worked on uh, a whole lot of um, uh, sort of early computer experiments uh, when he was at Bell Labs. Um, and Bell Labs really uh, kind of grew to be the most uh, well-known of all of the kind of commercial research labs. And their their research into um, computer interfaces and uh, just computer use in general um, went on into the 80s, um, was sort of their heyday from the 60s to the 80s. Um, and as you can tell, uh, Bell Labs, I don't know if anyone has heard of a, um, the Big Bell or, you know, uh, the Bell Labs basically was the telephone company. Um, and they were trying to extend their research and development area into new uh, and interesting areas because they understood that the telephone probably was not going to be the next major invention. Um, and they were absolutely right. So uh, Noel sort of made this drawing, and it's really just a total um, experiment of what you can do with a computer. Um, that's really all it is. Um, you'll notice in a lot of the early computer art pieces that we look at, there's not a lot of content in quite a few of them. Um, and I think the reason uh, 
you know, it's because at the time in art, there was a lot of abstraction going on. So I think that some of these uh, researchers really wanted to just kind of fit in with what was going on in, in art at the time. Um, I think the other reason why uh, you won't see a whole lot of content uh, is because uh, a lot of these people were just sort of asking questions like, what can I do with this algorithm or what can I do with this process? Um, in this case, the artist is using an early pen plotter. So, you know, they're saying, what, what can I do with a, with a pen plotter, which was a machine at that time that was, uh, really, uh, existed to make technical drawings. Um, and, uh, I'll show you later in my digital fabrication, uh, lecture, what sort of can happen with a pen plotter. Um, it's actually pretty amazing. So you also see artists who are making work that is sort of imitating other artwork or imitating the artwork of maybe 30 or 40 years, um, you know, uh, uh, before them. So, so here you see, uh, Frieder Nock. He's uh, out in Berlin and he is, um, basically making these, um, I guess I wouldn't call them imitations, but they're sort of musings on, uh, paintings by Paul Klee, who was another uh, German artist who was very popular during the Expressionist era. And I think he chose Paul Klee uh, specifically because if you look at some of Paul Klee's um, uh, individual works, you, you can't really get much further away from a computer rendering. They're very handmade. They're very... Um, they're very idiosyncratically drawn. Um, and so I think that part of what Frieder Nock is trying to do here is to try to see if the computer can capture any of that quality or what a work of art looks like with that quality drained out of it. Um, because it's, again, at this time in early computer art, lines and lines and dots are pretty much all you get. Um, <laughs> that's pretty much uh, all there was in the sort of, you know, visual, um, lexicon of computer art of the time. So uh, it was minimal, uh, not by design, it was min minimal, because uh, it relied on what then was still pretty primitive technology, even though it was incredibly advanced from their perspective. Um, you also start to see, um, we talked a little bit about the industrial arts in our, in our last talk. And, uh, this is definitely another moment where the industrial arts and the sort of fine arts or the applied arts, as they may be called them at this time, um, start to kind of coalesce with, um, with, uh, fine art. And they do that through the, uh, through the computer. And so what we're looking at here is, um, an illustration of human figures. And uh, I think we could probably make the argument that they might be male figures. Um, and uh, it's basically, um, you know, uh, taken from an ergonomics uh, pro sort of, you know, exercise in designing um, cockpits and that sort of thing. So they would create these sort of simulated, um, you know, three-dimensional people. Um, for, you know, measuring out how big does the cockpit need to be, where does the, you know, joystick need to go relative to the chair. And so, so it was really for a completely functional perspective. Um, but then they take that out of that context. And um, sorry, I got the cat meowing, the phone ringing. Um, they take they take it out of that context to uh, sort of art of what I call artify it. Um, in other words, take it from the applied arts and elevate it to the fine arts. Um, and so that's a strategy that you'll see used with digital art constantly, um, absolutely constantly. Um, and I guess just lastly, I want to say that you know this is also kind of a creepy image um, in terms of the way that it. Uh, you know, kind of generalizes the human form. And I think that that's one of the things that people in the art community in particular were, I would say, the majority, this is, um, you know, playing with percentages here, the majority of people at this time in the art community were pretty hostile to technology and to the use of technology and art. 
um, you found a few people who were willing to kind of um, work with these labs um, who were actually, you know, artists by trade. Um, but for the most part, you see uh, a kind of deep uh, kind of um, skepticism of technology kind of run through uh, the entire history of art and technology. Um, and so the, the fact that it uh, erases, you know, one's humanity uh, is one of the very first um, sort of things that people would identify as a, as a negative effect of technology. Um, and so we'll talk about more. And that's kind of going to run through the whole class as a theme. So another thing that happened with these kind of early works of computer art is that you can see that um, the in some of the slides I've met, you know, I've mentioned in writing um, before that um, there's really not that many people doing this work um, at this time. Uh, they're getting some publicity, um, but you know there aren't that many people at these four or five or six, well, let's be generous, maybe seven or eight universities around the world that are doing this type of uh, work. And a lot of times people ask me, you know, why, why are there so few people in, in that era who are doing computer art? Because it seems so interesting and, you know, people knew it was out there um, because, you know, you would see it in, literally in the newspaper. Some of these computer art images were that that interesting to people back then. Um, and I guess the short answer is just accessibility. Um, it wasn't accessible for a couple of reasons. It wasn't accessible because no, literally nobody could afford a computer. No one individual, unless you were just like, you know, Jeff Bezos or something, nobody could afford a computer. And not just that, but computers weren't something that you carry around with you in your pocket back then. Computers were something that you actually went to um, to do your work. And you can see here, this is a, a an example of the kind of system that people are working with into the 70s and 80s. And this is one of the things that made the um, the whole personal computing revolution so, well, revolutionary. Um, when you look at this room, this blue room, uh, those towers, kind of those blue towers surrounding this desk, those are the actual computer. Um, the uh, This is what's called a terminal, and it's totally dumb. It's just basically feeding information back into this so-called mainframe. And so, so that sort of setup for computing was really not great for, you know, people sharing stuff, for people, um, you know, doing uh, computing in their spare time, in their houses, um, and uh, even uh, using computers in universities. You had to book time on this computer, um, similarly to the way you would have to book time to use um, uh some x you know x-ray uh x-ray machine here on campus if you're um you know using that type of technology so so the technology itself i it's hard to stress like how in a, just how inaccessible it it was back then um in terms of other strategies we're going to see with digital uh sort of early digital and early computer art one that's going to keep popping up a lot, and this might, I don't know, this smells like a final exam question, um, is, uh, has to do with the way that the images were composed. So if you see the last couple of images we've looked at were sort of like freeform or freehand um, kind of drawings where the mark is just going all over the place. Um, and here, uh, there seems to be a much more organized kind of logic to this. And again, this is, you know, sort of classic early computer art. Um, what we've got happening here is a sort of series of very simple shapes. So we have uh, like an inner don't, an inner inner circle, an outer circle. We have uh, a terminus and a terminus. And then we actually just have these uh, arc shapes. And so this, I can guarantee you, because I've seen a documentaries on, you know, how the this um, how this works, and I also have worked with this type of algorithm. This is probably made of 
just, um, you know, repetitions of those five things. And uh, just by the name, uh, cellular auto automata, well, you can, you can kind of deduce from that name uh, the following things, maybe, that it's made of cells. Um, and indeed, in this image, the grid uh, divides the image into cells. And then each cell sort of becomes an automata, which uh, is very close to a, a, an algorithm called the game of life, where um, the, these sort of um, simple shapes get chosen based on uh, a somewhat, you know, kind of uh, natural progression. And it's, it's very interesting. If you're interested in the simulation of life, this is actually a really great place to really great place to start, um, cellular automata. So the important thing here, though, is that this is indeed sort of following a grid-based system. And part of the reason for that is because grid-based systems are just so easy to program. <laughs> and as a programmer, I feel like I can say that. Um, I mean, that's, that's a big... Um, that's a big contributing factor into why so many early computer artists would choose the grid. Um, another factor is that, uh, you know, grids are really good for showing the emergence of difference between two things. So um, you can start to sort of like build, it's a building block for a composition. So if I were a computer artist, early computer artist, I would probably use grids too. Um, here's Vera Molnar, and when I said that you, with a grid you can really see difference, um, and th and that is definitely true. I mean, she's um, she's one of the very few women, by the way, in uh, early in the early computer art world, and she's working out of Berlin. Um, she's kind of an, has, has an interesting story. She lived to be about ninety, uh, and she made computer art until the day she died, um, and that was uh, pretty pretty recently. So. So in her work, you can sort of see this idea of, you know, similarity and difference in that I'm going to use the same building blocks, but I'm going to get a different result in each part of the grid. That's like a cl that's a classic um, early computer art question or early computer art strategy. Um, you'll see tons and tons of work uh, that's similar to this. Um, although I think that personally, uh, Vera Molnar, I'm somewhat partial to. Um, this also sort of maybe like starts to uh, address or starts to at least suggest some of the, you know, gender politics that might have been embedded in early computer art. And so this was one of the very first images that simulated a photograph. Um, and it did so, you can see by, uh, it's an ASCII drawing. So it uses ASCII characters, which are the same little characters that we saw in our JPEG when it was kind of uh, you know, under the hood. Um, and it takes those ASCII characters and kind of codes them in for different areas of darkness and lightness in the image. And uh, the use of the pixel system up to this point didn't really exist. So this is basically, um, the reason I show this image is because it's a historically important image. Um, because it really was one of the very first pixel-based images in the entire world. Um, I also show this image because I think it's an interesting kind of nod to art history. Um, so they could have taken any photograph in the world, but they decided to, uh, they decided to use this photo of a reclined nude woman. Um, and what that tells me, um, you know, aside from any potential, like, um, uh, judgments that might be somewhat unfair, because I don't know these guys, um, the the big thing that that tells me is that they want to be legitimate artists and um so what am i what do i mean by that well i guess i mean that um in in art history um at the time that was sort of one of the main uh and most common tropes in visual imagery if you went to an art museum it would just be full of um of uh, nude figures. And uh, of course, um, you know, society has kind of come a long way since then. Um, this is 
50, almost 50 years ago. So, um, you know, maybe getting started on this foot might not work today. Um, although I do think that uh, rather than being maybe a purely sexist statement, which let's be clear here, it's a little bit sexist. Um, I think they are actually trying to associate themselves to art history, maybe more than um, to create, you know, a, a negative or, you know, uh, they're certainly reinforcing, <laughs> they're certainly reinforcing a, a negative, rep maybe ne negative representation of women that's out in art history. So um, I think it's important to show this kind of imagery because I think it's, you know, it's an important part of history and I think we have to kind of confront it um, and, you know, pick it apart and think about some of the different factors that led to this image even existing in the first place. Um, so yeah, there's your first pixel, pixel based image ever. This is the second pixel based image ever. Much more, much easier to explain. It's the Beatles. And so uh, the, uh, you know, whole kind of idea of making pixel based images caught caught fire <laughs> pretty quickly. Um, and you'll see about 10 years after this image was made, you'll start to see actual kind of color systems and color pixels. Um, and, you know, the whole pixel based format is going to become, uh, you know, one of the dominant formats for image making. So um, somebody had to figure it out, though, and somebody had to invent it. So it's kind of fascinating to look through the stuff. So as we kind of shoot into the 70s, we're looking at a sort of world in which very few people are working with um, art and technology in any kind of way because it's sort of cloistered in institutions. Uh, machines are expensive. Machines are big. They don't uh, allow you to, you know, take them home for the evening. Um, and you uh, really, you know, have this kind of, um, I mean, the Apple, the original Apple commercial really says it all um, with the guys, um, you know, sort of dealing with these drab businessmen types. Um, you know, those that was that was computing um, in the late 70s. And um you start to see uh, the sort of personal computer revolution. And interestingly enough, we're gonna see this in another video that we watch in this class um, in a different context. Um, interestingly enough, the Apple II or even the uh, Apple was not the first computer to allow people to have a sort of personal computing environment. Um, I think we can definitely point to Xerox as being uh, Xerox Corp, you know, the copy machine people. Yeah, um, that Xerox. They actually uh, led the charge for a lot of um, early computer research. Uh, and they basically got, you know, uh, kind of gobbled up by um, Apple and or Apple just uh, Apple and uh, Microsoft just outright stole a lot of their uh, intellectual property. So that's a whole other story. We're not going to talk about that much. But um, but what you do see is this sort of, um, you know, br broad interest um, in computing. And by broad, I mean, like your your aunt or your uncle might call you up and ask if you want to see their new computer or, um, you know, your cousin has one. It's it becomes very uh, becomes very um, distributed throughout some uh, classes of our society. And I think that that's the important maybe fu function to note about, you know, the early personal computer revolution is that, um, you know, there is a thing called the digital divide and uh, that sort of got perpetuated and sort of started um, with, you know, uh, the advent of personal computers. Um, so let's move sort of rocket up to the 80s and 
In the 80s, you start to basically see artists really get serious about using technology in ways that no one has ever done before. And this is a guy named Daryl Viner. And he uh, starts to um, use technology to generate images that are fundamentally abstract, but also sort of capture some of the zeitgeist of like 3D computer uh, computer animation that we're starting to see in films and we're starting to see in um, television. And so it's this weird crossover of... Um, the entertainment industry now, not so much the defense industry, but the entertainment industry is kind of creeping up on computers and uh, sort of shifting the language of computer art more towards entertainment and less towards, um, you know, the industrial arts, as we maybe looked at in the early, really early computer art stuff. So this was a woman um, named uh, Stella Orsini, who... Um, was a fellow at uh, the Visual Visible Language Workshop at MIT, and what they're doing is they're they're basically experimenting with images, um, and they're doing so in a way that's not necessarily purely scientific, but that they write might write scientific papers about. Um, so the uh, the MIT Media Lab is sort of a long storied sort of institution that goes along with the creation of computer art in this kind of rarefied context. Um, and, uh, you know, you see in, it get going in the 80s and it um, starts to sort of become uh, a really reliable way of churning out art uh, that goes straight out to the art market. Um, and so this is kind of where I would put this, um, the 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 cat I would put this in the category of um, the sort of you know fine art uh, experiment with technology and uh, really that work starts to happen mostly in the 1980s. Um, it's partially that it starts to happen, but it's also that people start to look at it as art um, in a way that uh, didn't happen as much with. Um, with the early computer art. And I think that part of that just has to do with people's familiarity overall, like the culture's familiarity with, um, you know, what a personal computer is and what uh, certain things, you know, are in, in computing. How difficult something is to do, unfortunately, is a really um, fundamental way of kind of judging the value of the uh, a work of of digital art so so when we see these works being made you can see that they're um they're they bear a closer re resemblance to digital art um that we already have or or even art that came before it so this is pretty crazy um the sort of zeitgeist, you know, moving towards an embrace of technology is definitely something that happened a lot in the 1980s. Um, and a great example of that is this television show. It was a, a British television show called Max Headroom. And uh, it was basically a guy dressed up in, pl in a plastic sort of like, you know, mask and stuff. And his hair was all kind of plasticed over. Sorry, excuse me. Um, and he would basically, uh, kind of talk about, hang on, sit down, sit. Yes. Good boy. He would talk about, um, you know, just anything that a normal talk show host would talk about. Um, and so it, but the whole premise of the show was that he was actually an android and he was not, he was a real dude that was in makeup. Um, so it was it was one of the weirdest shows in the 80s, um, and it was definitely kind of um, put in this category of like futuristic fiction, uh, even back then. Um, so if you're looking for something really weird, it's an interesting essay to read. And then we also have um, a, uh, this is a silkscreen print. Um, so this sort of flaming cube is a really great example of 
uh, sort of how the, what the 80s did to computer art. Um, and if we think all the way back to, you know, that sort of cube, um, cube drawing um, by Freyd or Nock, um, and or even the one by a a bell um it's sort of like you know you had one line and you had to make the most of it right um it's just incredibly simple um and then we look at something like this and it's literally been like kind of set on fire um with these uh incredibly uh complex um vector lines that you can see uh even from uh, an image like this you can see how delicate and how uh, complex some of those movements are. Um, so, so it's really, uh, you know, kind of taking some of the principles of the work done in the sixties and seventies. And, you know, the eighties says, I have 10,000 times more pixels or I have 10,000 times more, um, more, uh, nodes in my vector lines or points in my lines. Um, so it's a pretty it's pretty kind of like common juxtaposition is that uh you the thing that you see the most when you look at the work from the 80s is you can just tell that there have been a lot of advances in the actual hardware um and that's not necessarily a reflection <laughs> that the artists are not any you know any better or worse but um it just kind of comes through um, so this guy, uh, Harold Cohen, is a really interesting um, kind of early digital artist. He uh, was actually uh, kind of known as a painter. And uh, and when I say painter, I mean like kind of old school, you know, abstract painter. Um, he decided to uh, become a, a visitor at, at Stanford and... By doing that, he worked with an artificial intelligence lab to create a, a painting that basically functioned um, a painting machine or a painting algorithm. And in here, it's a drawing, of course, but he did eventually uh, make paintings. And so this algorithm could take pictorial elements and kind of redraw them on the screen. So if you see this, um, these rocks, you know, you may no you may notice or you may not notice that some of these rocks have similar characteristics, right? Um, well, so these rocks are being kind of dynamically composed, and same thing with all these natural elements. Same thing with the people. Everything everything in this so called drawing was something that was coded, um, and then basically uses AI algorithms to create unique objects based on you know, kind of looking at the objects around it. So he's kind of fascinating um, and kind of um, a little bit uh, maybe not very well known, but e even though he did some really important stuff. Um, so he uh, just uh, basically kind of worked on this um, image, image making through AI for his entire career and his entire life. Um, and by the time he got done with it, he did actually generate some uh, images that, you know, could be uh, paintings or could be um, really full, sort of full, fully featured, you know, kind of uh, images. So uh, I think he's uh, an interesting person. So... I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time talking about the 90s because the 90s definitely was one of those times um, where, you know, it's kind of seems like a space between like the 80s and, and the the aughts. Um, but uh, of course, there were some really important things that did happen in the 90s. Um, and I guess the most important thing would be, oh, like the Internet. Um, the Internet was definitely... Uh, one of those things. And I guess people could make arguments about the internet existing in the 80s. And I guess they wouldn't be totally wrong. Um, there were certainly uh, news use, use net and other services available in the 80s. Um, and there were also these sort of walled garden services, you know, like um, net, that were finite in networks. Um, but really, the uh, the sort of World Wide Web got going in the mid '90s, and that became kind of the 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 thing that mobilized everything that we know of as the internet. Um, 
And in some ways, I think uh, the culture that we're participating in now with regard to certain apps and um, certain networks actually maybe is not the the same sort of um, uh, culture that the founders of the World Wide Web would have intended. Um, I think that um, in general, you know, uh, the uh, you've probably heard this from other people, but the the web has gotten much more commercialized um, than it used to be. Um, and so, you know, that's just one of the maybe growing pains of the of the service. Um, so I think we're also sort of seeing, uh, you know, right now we're in a moment of in pretty, pretty extreme uh, skepticism uh, towards certain technologies and how they might affect our society um, and our political system. Um, so social media, for example, um, where, you know, in the 90s, if you if you heard about a new website, you know, that had a um, some kind of user, you know, user account where you could see other people's profiles, you would be like, oh, cool, sign me up. Um, you wouldn't even think uh, at all about any kind of downsides. Um, this sort of optimism kind of carried into probably into the into the aughts, you know, um, although that sort of, uh, you know, saw kind of the development of, you know, other things like social media. Um, so anyway, um, basically, I mean, the 90s is sort of like the 80s plus networks. Um, but um, you start to see the emergence of a couple of of a couple of um, methods of making art. Yes, you're a bad boy. Um, you start to see a couple methods of making art that really are only possible because of the internet. And so one of those methods is what I like to call stuff being done on the internet as art. Um, and so this is a really great kind of early uh, example of that genre of new media art. Um, this is called Telegarden. And through a, a console, you could actually see um, a little web window, you could actually see and control the this garden bot. Um, you could water it, you could give it food, um, you know, fertilizer, you could give it light. Um, and it's sort of a, you know, now just like part of part of um, internet art history. Um, but it's certainly something that uh, that idea of, you know, doing something remotely, um, as a work of art um, is something that during that 20 year period between the 80s and the aughts, um, you started to see a lot of that. And I think that one of the reasons why artists were so interested in working with remoteness or the idea of controlling something remotely was because of the whole idea that um, many of our wars had been, uh, we're at that time, you know, thinking about um, Iraq, we're thinking about Afghanistan, you know, uh, and then, of course, post 9-11, we had the Iraq War. Um, so a lot of these uh, technologies are kind of, um, you know, using the idea of remoteness as kind of a metaphor for drone warfare, or even just, um, you know, the idea of being disembodied from something that is really important, and a really important human kind of thing that people do. So, for example, gardening. <laughs> um, so, you know, you might, uh, I'm sure everyone has a sort of like, um, maybe pop culture based example of, uh, you know, doing something on the internet as art. Um, I'm, I'm thinking also of this uh, artist who stood in a gallery this was probably in like 2013, 2014. He lived in a gallery in New York for about um, three months, I think, and had people shoot him with a with a uh, paintball gun. Um, and he he was an Iraqi American, and it was basically all about um, kind of opening up the internet's hatred onto him. Um, and it was a you know definitely extremely controversial piece and it was a piece that kind of made people really question what the boundaries of art were um 
but it's also a piece that you know uh was definitely remembered um and definitely made an impact on the cultural conversation so so but again it falls into that category of doing stuff over the internet uh becoming art so you also start to see in i guess in the 90s and this is mo i would say of moderate importance um you also start to see the you know if you think back maybe 10 minutes ago in the in the lecture we saw our reclining nude woman the sort of like stereotypical you know art um that that image was probably about like 20 by you know 100 pixels or 30 by 100 pixels um so this image i actually have seen it in person it's absolutely gorgeous it's um it's 120 inches by 240 inches and i can guarantee you it's at least 600 dpi so i i don't have my calculator on me right now but uh that is pr at least a, a million pixels. Um, it's a lot. Um, maybe not, might not be that much. But anyway, it's a ton of pixels. It's a, the sort of, um, you know, capability to create pixels has gone up uh, an order of magnitude, which uh, lines up pretty well with um, one of uh, computing's funnier laws. Um, what you also should probably know about this image is that this was really one of the first images where you start to see other cultures sort of enter the art market in a in a way kind of on their own terms um the art market in america has you know f made kind of fetish objects out of objects from other cultures um for a long time and uh this image by marika mori she is um a really interesting artist who has an interesting story she used to be a fashion model um for shiseido the cosmetics company in japan um and then she became uh this like computer pioneer <laughs> so um she went back to design school after her uh you know experience as a fashion model and she started th making this this work that um, kind of talked about, you know, traditional Buddhist themes, the kind of stuff that you would see in a tanka or a painting, a uh, religious painting, um, but also so kind of combined it. Um, and you'll, if you look at any more of her work, you'll see this kind of combined it with this like cartoon aesthetic um, that really kind of modernized it in a way that people were not used to seeing. Um, and so she's, uh, definitely deserves some props as like a pioneer. Um, and definitely also, I think it's a great example of what they call new photography, which is, um, you know, photography that is not straight, um, or that has some sort of digital component to it. So we've got just a couple of more, uh, things here. Uh, I wanted to show you the, uh, this Benjamin Edwards painting. So this is early in the aughts and, um, it's st sort of beginning that kind of cultural moment of crit 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 criticality towards technology, um, that we're in right now. Um, so he took a bunch of like icons and logos and just kind of, um, works in his own sort of uh, 3D space and then takes the uh, imagery and uh, makes paintings out of them. So he's actually, a, you know, at the end of the day, he's a, he's a painter, even though he works in these um, really sophisticated, like 3D, um, 3D sort of programmed environments that he actually programs himself. Uh, it's kind of amazing. So, um, when he made this image, I know he was really in interested in the whole concept of information over overload and uh, the whole idea that um, sort of mass culture and mass society was kind of out to like kind of just choke us all, you know, it's very cheery. Um, we also see sort of Ryan McGinnis, um, and he's really functioning as like a, a pop artist. Um, so we may look at a couple of more of his works. Um, this work is a screen print, but of course it's, uh, it's, you know, not, uh, drawn out by hand. He's, you know, printing it on film and then exposing the screen. Um, and so he, 
pretty much his entire career is just based on really fancy screen printing. Um, and he even screen prints acrylic on canvas, which is how this was made. Um, so even though it's a it's a painting, it's actually printed onto the canvas, um, which is kind of funny. Um, also, we have, and this is like kind of the now, dec the now decade. This is in the last 15 years, by the way. Um, so we have uh, Takashi Murakami, who is doing a really amazing job of basically like kind of owning every every art market all over the world. He's probably the um, probably the most uh, financially successful artist right now of the moment. Um, and he has worked a lot with celebrities. He worked um, he did uh, some stuff for Kanye back when he was still cool a long time ago. Um, and he also, uh, you know, has done projects for Louis Vuitton. And so he's like a weird, he's a weird figure in the art world, like, because he's so commercialized, but yet he is coming from a kind of fine art perspective. Um, and you can see here, he's using, you know, the Photoshop grid. This is the Photoshop transparency grid in the back there. And, uh, you know, he works with this incredibly pop based style, but I actually, um, I'm not one who usually goes for this type of work, but I have to say, I think he's probably one of the most interesting artists working out today. Um, he's got a, he's got a whole sort of like symbolic language with every aspect of the flower color and the sort of these florets in the eyes. Um, so when I actually did read about his work, it, it just uh, made it a lot it made me see it in an incredibly different light. Um, and then, of course, we do have Super Mario Clouds. So Super Mario Clouds is often credited as being the the video that, ma that made uh, digital media art. And uh, basically what it's doing is it's taking uh, an old sort of um, theme of uh, the ready-made and kind of bringing it to the digital generation. So the ready-made is when an artist finds like a shovel in, you know, in their sh garage and takes it into the gallery and says, this is my, this is my art. So, um, you know, yeah. Um, in any case, you can watch the video. Um, I'm not going to show it right now because we're a little short on time. Um, but it is probably the most famous work of digital media art that's been made in the last 20 years. Um, it's also sort of often mocked um, as being a little bit uh, sort of um, as not, you know, not requiring any craft. So depending on what you want out of a work of art, you may or may not like this. And then we also see sort of like this, you know, kind of interest in, uh, you know, you might look at something like that and say, oh, that's computer art now. That's what people are doing. And <laughs> this is sort of like the punk rock version of computer art. Um, the sort of, you know, hyper technical, you know, has a has a PhD in computer science type computer art is still definitely uh, out there. It's just, um, you know, it's still being done and there's still lots of people doing it so this guy mitchell whitelaw is a really interesting person who's definitely like a kind of um what we would call in in today's parlance a computational artist um and he uh, made this uh video called watching the sky by taking a taking a, a pixel sample of what was fed into him through through a video camera um every you know hour for a certain period of time or every so so many minutes um but i know that this uh this wheel here actually represents 24 hours of of having this camera out and getting these small slices of what the sky looks like i thought that was really great um you also see this like amazing crossover right now between information design and art um, and that's been going on probably for 20 years. Um, the, uh, this is a really early example of uh, a data visualization, and um, it's done in uh, a language called processing. Um, you may also see, of course, you know, just data visualizations that are in the newspaper and on your phone and <laughs> all sorts of places like that. So the data visualization um, 
as kind of a format has definitely got come into like ubiquitous um uh distribution you know especially for anybody that watches and reads the new york times on online or you know i mean there are so many websites now that use uh, data visualization to a to a greater or lesser extent um so it's something that you'll see a lot i mean i think it's it is important to realize that that kind of visual language wasn't really available 20 years ago um so the idea that people know exactly what they're doing with the visual language of data visualization is something that I'm not entirely convinced of, meaning that uh, it's pretty easy to make something look slick, um, but it might not actually deliver any information. Um, and that could be a potential hazard, um, you know, just as much as social media could. So I'm going to uh, leave you with a couple of uh, images of what we would all call today generative art or also computational art. Um, and basically, it's just art that's made with some kind of code or art that's made with uh, algorithms. So it, it's pretty much the logical extension of some of the computing early computer work that's been that was done in the 60s and 70s. Um, but, you know, you can see now it's got a lot more lines, a lot more pixels, it's much more complex. Um, and I think in some ways that can be kind of its uh, downfall in some ways. Um, these are two images by Casey Reese, who's sort of the granddaddy of um, uh, generative art. And he runs the design, he's actually uh, runs the design school at UCLA now. Um, but he creates these um really beautiful, really complex, uh, you know, images from code. Um, and they're, they're beautiful. I think that any, you know, person who wanted to be really critical would say, what does it mean? Um, and, you know, that's a fair, that's a fair assessment. Um, I think that there are, certainly are people who are using this technology in a way that's maybe uh, n not as sort of, um, focused on the visual. Um, but that is what it's kind of good at. Um, so you do see, um, you know, artists like Matt Desalier, um using it in a very sort of formal, in other words, it's all about the form, it's not about the content um, kind of way. And so, so that's really where generative art is at. I think that, you know, if I, if I, individually had a critique of generative art, I guess it would be that I, I wanted a little more content. But um, some people are doing that work. Um, and some people haven't really figured it out yet. So um, I'm going to leave you here with uh, these natural systems drawings and just kind of uh, remind you that, you know, everything that's old is new again. And a lot of the early computer art images that we looked at um, are actually very much in vogue right now um, in the kind of coding community. And you'll see uh, images in the creative coding community that kind of borrow from those uh, moments in computing culture. So I'll see you soon for beginning Photoshop. Yay!